Today, I'm on my rounds along the Posties path. Hello, and welcome to Lambert. I'm in the breathtakingly beautiful Koyesh Peninsula in west of Ross, and I'll be finding out how this recently upgraded coastal path was once a super highway for the local people living in this remote area and kept them connected to the outside world. More on that later, but first, here's what else is coming up. We meet the real monsters of Loch Ness. The biggest one we've recorded here so far was 16 pounds in weight. The average size would probably be about two pounds. Dramatic evidence of Scotland's shifting coastlines. We are pretty much standing on the beach at that point in time. Wow. We're obviously much higher above sea level today. And Ewan takes an artful look at the Kingfisher. A dart of fire in morning mist. Electric blue, the dawn's rays kiss. Now, you may be aware that Glasgow is hosting the UN's climate change conference known as COP26. And here in Scotland, we already have many farmers who are trying to work in more environmentally friendly ways. Back in March, Ewan went to Perthshire to meet a man who's putting his sheep in a rather unusual position. This is a great time of year if you're a cereal farmer. This field of winter wheat would have been planted at the back end of the summer and grown slowly over the winter. Now, with the longer days and, well, sort of warmer weather, it's about to spring into life. And this is a bunch of hungry Texel cross hogs. You wouldn't want them getting anywhere near those tasty shoots. Or would you? Here at Balgi, Ian Wilkinson farms in a share agreement with owners Ian and Sheena Graham. And he's about to give these guys a real treat. Uh, we're just going to put them through into this fresh field of uh, winter wheat for them to graze. Come by, Stella. The first uh, thoughts were to find a way to graze our new hogs as cheaply as we possibly could through the winter. What started as an attempt to cut down on feed costs has turned into an experiment to find out whether grazing might actually help winter crops. When Ian's texels reach the gate, they seem a bit hesitant. Maybe they're checking the grass, or in this case, the wheat is actually greener. But temptation soon gets the better of them. And it turns out they aren't the first sheep to taste the tips. It's an old concept, Ewan. Uh, they used to do it a long, long time ago, before they had all the synthetic chemicals and fertilizers that we have today to just hold that crop back until we get into the real growing season. If the plant gets too strong, if there's too much growth there in the wet weather, it can cause uh, fungus to get in and actually cause disease on the leaves. And then when the plant starts to grow, it's, it's uh, getting attacked by this fungus all the time. Using less fungicide is just one benefit of the grazing. What the sheep give back to the land fertilizes the soil, improving its biodiversity and feeding the crop. It's supposed to be a tricky balance between getting it right and getting it wrong where they graze it down too far. You could kill the plants off. Yeah, there is a possibility, but we'll just have to be kind of careful that we do get them out at the right time. Are you seeing an increased yield? We've seen uh, up to half a tonne a hectare more in uh, winter barley and slight increases in yields in the winter wheat, but it's very much a learning game. They seem to be doing well on it, though. Yep, they are thriving. They've uh, surpassed my expectations and what they would have been able to do on it, so I'm quite pleased. And we plan to do a lot more next year. The success of Ian's work 
has inspired a study by Scotland Rural College, funded by the European Union. This is a real win-win situation. The sheep are being fed, which reduces the amount of fodder that they have to have. The yield is up and the dependence on fungicide is minimised. It's elegant and it's efficient, with real benefits for the planet. What's not to like? The well-trodden path I'm on today used to be one of the few ways of getting across the Coyach Peninsula in Wester Ross. Clinging to the side of Benmore Coyach, it runs through the Scottish Wildlife Trust's largest reserve. It's known as the Posties Path, and Anne Campbell, hello, hello. who lives near the end of the track, can tell me more about it. I'm guessing by the name, it was used by posties. Yes, the original postman in the 1860s used to walk 23 kilometres from the post office in Achiltabui to Alapal post office. It was a, a big trek. And how do. often were they doing it? They were doing it twice a week and they got paid two shillings and three pence. I don't know what that is in today's money, but... <laughs> Still not very much. <laughs> I don't think it was, no. No. The post goes by road these days, and the path is mostly used for recreation, but it's still a challenging seven miles. It sounds quite a short distance, but actually it's pretty tough, you know, and it's rough, rough mountainous terrain, and you've got to be prepared for that, too, for all weathers. Doesn't look too bad today, but the years have taken their toll on the track. And as a member of the regeneration initiative, Koyach and Ascent Living Landscape, Anne has been part of the team that's been giving the path some TLC. So listen, thank you very much for all the information. I'm well warned. The track has been massively upgraded, with helicopters bringing in local stone to build up the most damaged areas. Even with this sprucing up, you get a flavour of how difficult it would have been getting the mail through. Do you know, there are parts of this that are still really quite difficult and uh, can you imagine 160 years ago posties with all the parcels all the letters and all the important information having to do this is unbelievable the scottish wildlife trust was also heavily involved in the restoration work ensuring important habitats were protected and the landscape preserved Mark, how's it going? Nice to see you. Hi, Diggy. Nice That's to see you too. Beautiful, beautiful view here it's stunning, today, isn't, isn't it? it? Mark Foxwell is reserve manager with the Trust. In front of you, we've got Loch Broom, and then way off to the west, you can just about make out um, the mountains of Harris, uh, and then closer to home, there's the Summer Isles here, and then behind me is uh, Garve Coriachin, which is uh, the end of a long, sinuous ridge that goes right to the top of Benro Coyach. So you've got the kind of the smaller hills here, you've got the loch below and the high mountains behind, so all manner of wildlife and topography here as well. That's it, within a very short space of time you can, you can see ptarmigan uh, and you can see basking sharks, so it's quite extraordinary really. Extraordinary and spectacular. The access the path provides is worth all the effort that's been put into the upgrade. All oh, right, you can really sort of see the work you've been putting in here. This is a, this is a great job. Why did you have to do it in the first place? Well, one of the main reasons was because people kept getting stuck here overnight. Um, they couldn't find a way in and they couldn't find a way back again. So way marking is helping with that. But also it's really historically interesting um, and it's just a fantastic walk. The restoration work has made it easier, but not too easy. Mark was keen for the track to keep its demanding nature. You know, it's a challenge. Um, even for someone who's fit, you'll feel it by the end of it. <laughs> it, it retains its kind of mountain character. It's not, it's not a walk in the park. It's still a, a mountain route. And one that would be recognisable to those hardy mail carriers from long ago. And now, as well as fantastic views, Scotland is famous for many other things. Tartan, 
haggis, bagpipes. And one of our biggest attractions must surely be the Loch Ness Monster. But as Anne discovers, Nessie isn't the only mysterious creature lurking in these watery depths. Second only to Loch Lomond in surface area, Loch Ness is the UK's largest body of water by volume, 7.4 billion cubic metres. That's almost 3 million Olympic-sized swimming pools. And that's a lot of water for enigmatic beasties to hide in. So you can see the, this burn is a classic spawning burn. It's got lots of fallen trees and overhanging bushes. Chris Conroy works for the Nest District Salmon Fishery Board. He's been monitoring salmon that spawn on one of the loch's tributaries, and recently he spotted something very unusual. We were down here one day, slightly earlier than the salmon spawning time, and we spotted a really big fish, a really big fish this sort of size. I thought it's too early for a salmon. So um, we decided to pop a camera in, and it turned out it was a large brown trout, which are known as ferox trout. These fish spend most of their time in the depths of big glacial lochs like Loch Ness here and quite often at below 100, uh, 100 feet deep so they, they, they spend a lot of time in very deep water. So you basically don't see them very often. Chris and his team monitor the rivers so that they can better protect the habitat and they're thrilled at the discovery of this unusual type of trout. When they're young, just like regular trout, Ferrocks mainly eat insects and other invertebrates, but when they reach about 35 centimetres, a mysterious transformation takes place. When they hit about four or five years old, they switch from a diet of invertebrates to a diet of fish, and specifically ferox trout are thought to feed on another species of fish called an arctic char, which again lives in deep glacial lochs, and because they, they eat that protein-rich diet, they get very, very big. Um, so the biggest one we've recorded here so far was 16 pounds in weight. The average size brown trout would probably be about two pounds, um, but they get even they can get twice as big as as that. So they can get in excess of 30 pounds. So they are huge fish. Real Loch Ness monsters, then? Absolutely, <laughs> they are. They are real Loch Ness monsters. <laughs> The team have been using cameras to monitor the fish for four years, and in 2019, for the first time, they were filmed spawning. It's the only time they rise from the depths of the loch, an incredibly rare sight, and Chris thinks that this might be the only footage of Ferox spawning ever captured. The males arrive first, and they'll basically fight each other for territory so they, they have a big hook jaw a bit like a salmon they have a kipe and they'll fight each other they get quite angry at each other and then um, a female will arrive and then she'll scope out an area of suitable gravel and then she uses a tail to cut a depression um, in the bed of the river and when she's ready she dips her tail down and she lays her eggs and the males rush in and fertilize the eggs and then she covers the eggs up again and, um, and then she goes basically and um, from the cameras we've been able to look year on year and identify the same individuals uh, in the same locations almost to the same to the meter under the same bush spawning and one fish we've had four years in a row and we give them names as well uh, the big 16 pound fish we saw on the camera and he's called brutus because he's so big as well as the cameras some of the ferox trout are being tracked with acoustic tags. Last year, 11 of the fish, including Brutus, were fitted with the sonic emitters. And back on the loch side, we can see and hear them in action. On the end of this stick is a hydrophone, and this allows Chris and his team to monitor the tagged trout. So, Let's see if we can find some of these giants today. Wish me luck. This here is a, basically a mobile receiver and this allows us to have a listen for the tags that are attached to the fish. I've got a, an example of one of the tags here. This is attached to the outside of the fish and it sends out a series of 
pings and they're encoded pings so it tells us how deep the fish is and also uh, the temperature of the water at the depth that the fish is at and you'll hear the background noise that's just the background noise in the lock at the moment okay. and what we're listening out for is a series of pings like that is that, yeah, is that, that a fish yeah and there we go that's a fish and that's fish number 1374 as well as the mobile unit, there are a number of fixed hydrophones around the loch which allows Chris to track the location of individual ferrets. Do you see this here? This is Brutus. So we've seen him now moving quite a way around the loch. We've detected him on a few occasions and he's travelling quite a, quite a big distance. And the whole idea of this um, project is to learn about the movements of these elusive fish in the loch because, you know, there's very, very little is known about them. Well, I always knew there was something quite special about this loch. It's been fascinating to learn more about the mysterious real life monsters that lurk here. And who knows what else Chris and his team will find beneath the deep. Now to the coast, something that's always changing advancing and retreating across the millennia. Nowhere more so than Fife, where I'm joining a team of scientists from St Andrews University, mapping our dynamic shoreline, revealing the landscape our ancestors would have known. But we're heading a bit further inland than I was expecting. Yeah, well, what we're here trying to do is understand where the sea levels were and the, what the environments were like over the last 20,000 years. We last met geophysicist Dr Richard Bates on Lamward, uncovering the mysteries of Callanish with Ewan on the Isle of Lewis. So this is the centre and this is where the lightning strike hit. Wow! Today, he should be working in Tanzania, but COVID-19 got in the way. Africa's loss, though, is our gain, and Fife has just as many secrets to reveal. The process is part of something we've been doing all around the coast of Fife, um, in lockdown here, because this is as far as we can go. Um, but it turns out that, that actually this is a really under-researched part of the world. And all around Fife, we've got what you see in the background here, which is these steep um, cuts in the hillsides. And they're almost like a series of stair steps. And that stair steps represent where the sea was at different times in the past. Richard's here to find out exactly when these steps were formed. Using his electromagnetic geophysics equipment, he's searching for underground deposits of sand. So I guess this technology makes your life a hell of a lot easier than it used to do many, many years ago, yeah? It saves us a lot of time and effort. When his measurements indicate a promising site, the heavy work starts. Dr Tim Kinnaird is digging for hidden bits of ancient beach. Tim, how are we doing? Good, thanks. You've got pretty deep there. Yeah, it's a good couple of metres. And what have you found so far? We've uh, sunk quite a few of these pits and you, there's nothing at the base. But in this case, it's been fantastic because we've got this big, thick half metre package of sand. I can date the sand, so I can tell the last time this sand was on the surface and exposed to daylight. Wow. But before the sand can be dated, Tim has to collect samples to be taken back to the lab. Not as straightforward as it sounds. Now, I know this all looks very sinister, but the sand under there hasn't been exposed to light for thousands of years. And it has to stay that way. The sand's luminescence is crucial in dating the sample. Here it comes. <laughs> Any exposure to sunlight will kill the ancient stored luminescence signal. Aye, aye. How are you? <laughs> are you fine? Yep. Did you get what you... Success. Oh, you've got success. You've done it. So that's all in the poly bag there. A pre-test will show if the sample is good. So we're just going to look to see if the sand has any luminescence. If it does, then we can date it. So there is, that's great news for us. Uh-huh. Uh, that's the spike here. That's showing us there's luminescence within the sediment. So yeah, we'll be able to date this. 
good news. Tim's data will help prove or disprove current theories about Fife's ancient coastline. Tim's colleague, Sarah Boyd, thinks that 16,000 years ago, we would have been getting our feet wet at this spot. We are pretty much standing on the beach at that point in time. Wow. We're obviously much higher above sea level today. Simplifying things, during the Ice Age, the sea wasn't higher, Scotland was lower. The huge pressure of ice pushing the land down. As the ice melted, the land lifted. And there was elevated sea level rise as well, but the uplift tend to outpace the sea level. So what we'll see is coming towards present day, the terraces and shorelines getting closer to present day sea level. So we were down there on that dig site, so that was a shoreline at some at one point, but, but a lot later than the, the one we're currently standing on. Yes, we think that with the models down at that shoreline, we're more around 12,000 years. So we're moving down as we're coming closer to present day. It's incredible to think that we may be standing on a beach from 16,000 years ago. But for Richard, it's not just about shifting shorelines. It's a gateway into our ancestors' lives after the last ice age. If we want to understand where the people were and how the people came back to Scotland, we must understand what the landscape was like. Human activity would have been concentrated on the shoreline and knowing its location helps archaeologists pinpoint areas for study. So all around Scotland we see these different sea levels. You can trace that all the way from here back up the Tay Estuary, Perth, almost up to Creef. So there's a lot of Scotland flooded. So we want to try and find the people, we've got to understand the land that they had available to them. You know, it's fascinating to see how the shoreline around us has been changing and morphing over thousands of years. It was very different for our ancestors, and it will be very different for our descendants. Time for a look at what's been catching your eye around the country. Well, I hope I'm getting a video of him. That ain't no mink, that's for sure. That's an otot. Come on, boys! <laughs> Good boys! We love sharing your videos. Please do keep them coming. Details on our website. Throughout lockdown, many of us found a new appreciation for the beautiful birds around us. And over the next couple of weeks, Ewan is going to be taking a closer look and sharing a few of his favourites, starting with a burst of colour. A dart of fire in morning mist. Electric blue, the dawn's rays kiss. The rising sun paints orange glow and fishes tremble in depths below. The water spear flits o'er the burn. The senses reel, the heartbeats churn, the cobalt flash, sensations sing. It's Scotland's own, the Fisher King. The Kingfisher is arguably our most colorful bird. Favoring slow moving, quiet streams, rivers and canals, it searches for small fish and larger aquatic insects. And surprisingly, they're being seen more frequently in Scotland, especially in the central belt and the east coast. And that's a sign that our rivers and our streams are becoming much less polluted. And that provides a healthier home for these stunning birds. Watching a kingfisher hunt is a real treat. For this is a master of air and water. 
They have excellent eyesight, adapted for both over and underwater. Once it's spotted its quarry, it locks on. A quick shuffle, and away it goes. The kingfisher's beak is perfectly evolved for maximising speed, hitting the water at up to 25 miles an hour while minimising splash. It's so aerodynamic that it's inspired the design of Japanese bullet trains. Fish are dispatched with a quick whack, making them easier to swallow. But fish bones can't be digested, so they're regurgitated later. It's said that a kingfisher was the first bird to fly from Noah's Ark after the flood, and it received its orange breast from the setting sun, the blue on its back from the sky, a true sign of peace, prosperity and love. And it's just wonderful to know that these incredible birds can be found so close to home. So next time you're walking by a quiet waterway, look for an overhanging branch and maybe you'll be lucky to spy a glimpse of this bonny bird. The cobalt flash, sensations sing. It's Scotland's own, the Fisher King. That brings us to the end of this week's programme. Here's what's coming up next time around. A place to stay for the threatened lapwing. This is what we would call a wader scrape. So we've got these lovely muddy edges. These are really insect rich habitats. And we meet the farmer capturing life in the country. I write um, madly until four o'clock in the morning and then regret it hugely the next day. Please join us for that and much, much more if you can. In the meantime, from the breathtakingly beautiful Koyak Peninsula in Wester Ross, thank you so much for your company. Bye for now.